My name is Marek Vašut and today I'm going to talk about these open source tools for FPGA development. So let me do a quick introduction of myself first. Uh, I work for this company, Denk Software Engineering. We do all sorts of uh, embedded real-time systems uh, development. We work on Ubuntu, Linux, Open Embedded, and we provide trainings. Uh, me, I mostly work on the Linux kernel, on the Ubuntu bootloader, Open Embedded, these sorts of things. And I'm also an FPGA hobbyist. Although this, this is starting to be like a bigger thing for me. So that's who I am. Now, let's get to the talk. Um, I'll structure it in the following way. First of all, I would like to introduce the FPGA technology itself, what, are, what the FPGAs are, how they work on the inside a little, so that you have an idea of what that is all about. And then I'll go through the entire um, process of generating the bitstream, which is the, the file which goes into the FPGA from the source files. And each, in each step, I would like to show you a couple of tools which are available, which are open source. Um, after that, we will have a demo, which is great, but I don't have a board with me, which I forgot in, in my hometown, which blows. But I'll show you a simulation, so you will at least be able to believe me that I'm doing something there. And finally, I would like to have a bit of a discussion why this is hard, although I, I kind of hope that this talk will give you an idea why there is so little open source tools for the FPGAs. Now, okay, let's get right into the FPGA start, FPGA part. Uh, what is an FPGA? Um, let me just ask you, how many of you know what the FPGA is? And that's excellent, great. And how many of you did ever work with an FPGA? Which, it's, oh, wow, excellent. Uh, I, I guess I can skip the first part even. But just for the recording, uh, FPGA is a, is a field programmable gate array. Uh, so think of it as a, as a chip where you can synthesize your custom logic design, your, lo your model of logic. Uh, it has a lot of IOs which you can bind to, to this, this logic design. And it is relatively high speed. Uh, the, the insides of the FPGA are clocked at like hundreds of megahertz, and you can put a, a lot of logic gates in there in the order of uh, thousands to millions and, and more. So that's the sort of thing it is. And it's fully programmable, so you can fully configure the logic on the inside. Now, um, what is this used for? Uh, basically, DSP, digital signal processing, so we can pipe the signal basically through the FPGA. You can just sample the signal on one side, connect it to the pins of the FPGA, and then do some transformation on the inside in a pipeline fashion, and then just output it on the other side of the FPGA, maybe in some different format. Uh, it's also often used for bus adapters. For example, uh, you have some sort of weird, um, let's say, aviation bus or some sort of obscure thing. So you can use an FPGA in case there is no dedicated converter chip and pull out something sane like an SPI from it. Um, and then there's the ASIC prototyping part. So, I mean, building chip is, chips is expensive, right? So you design the chip in the HDL language, put it into an FPGA, it will run at a really slow speed, but you can debug the chip and then when you are reasonably sure that the chip is okay-ish without any horrible bugs, then, then you spin out the buffer and build a real chip, and then do some more debugging and so on. So this is what the FPGAs are used for. Now, contemporary FPGAs are made by a couple of vendors, you know, like Xilinx, Altera, now part of Intel, uh, Latest, Microsemi, and so on. <clears throat> so let's take a look on the inside of the FPGA. Uh, I'm sure you can pardon my graphics. It's not awesome, but uh, it will do. Uh, on the left side here, you can see a top level uh, diagram of the FPGA. Now, um, on, on the edge of this diagram, you can see the IO pins. This is what connects the FPGA logic to the, in, to the outside world. This is where you connect your whatever LED or high speed ADC, this sort of stuff. And this is rooted into the chip. Now, the, the red stuff in the middle of the chip, this is where you uh, configure the programmable logic. This is where you put your logic models. This is called the um, logic array block in, in Altera parlance. Um, it's also called adaptive logic module in the, in the newer Altera chips. I believe it's CLB in the Xilinx chips and so on. Uh, so this is where you put your logic stuff. 
And obviously, there, uh, in the FPGA, there is a lot more of these, these kind of red clusters of, of logic blobs. And all of this is connected together by this, this blue stuff, which is the uh, global interconnect. So you model your logic in, in the red stuff, connect it together using the, the blue stuff that they interconnect, and then connect it to the outside again using the, the blue stuff uh, and the I.O. blocks, which are on the side. Now, if you look at the, the red cluster, the, the logic cluster, the logic uh, array block, um, you can see there at, at the top how it looks on the inside. Now, um, it is a little bit more complicated, but not so much. Um, the uh, logic array block is, is consisting of logic elements, which are the, the smallest uh, logic building blocks in the FPGA. Um, and these logic elements are connected through a local interconnect together so that they can communicate quickly with one another. And this is sort of micro-optimization, but, but it allows you to uh, build a slightly faster designs. The local interconnect, the green stuff, is then connected to the global interconnect. And yeah, this, this is how it works. Now, if you zoom in a little bit more even at the logic element, which is the, the really smallest building block, you'll see there is just a lookup table and a register in there. And this is really uh, what allows you to build both combinatorial and, and sequential logic. And um, by combining these together, you can build large logic designs. Now, uh, are there any questions to the architecture of the FPGA? Or any corrections, possibly? Um, yeah, no? OK, so I can move on, right? Now, uh, let's take a look at how we program the FPGA, how we put the, the content into it. Um, each vendor will provide you a tool chain. Uh, these are typically proprietary, closed source, big packages of stuff. Uh, typically in the in the ballpark of tens of gigabytes download. Altera has this, this quarters, Xilinx has Vivado, ISE. But uh, yeah, the, the problem is that that's, there's a lot of stuff. Most of it is not needed, really, if, if, if you are working with a small project. Um, of course, if you are working with something big, then you still uh, use a lot of these, these vendor tools. But uh, if you look at the vendor tools and analyze what they are really doing to, to get from the source of the design all the way to um, the bitstream, you can kind of divide it into three steps, basically. Uh, one of them is analysis synthesis, then there is uh, place and root, and finally assembler. And on the side, there are two more uh, steps, which is timing analysis. This is important for high-speed designs. And then completely on the side is simulation and visualization. Now, um, I would like to go through all these steps and show you the tools. Uh, just to give you a kind of high-level overview of, of what each of these steps does, uh, the first step, the, the analysis synthesis, um, you can think of it as, as it reads the source HDL files and converts them into a sort of schematic of, of the circuit. That's the netlist. Uh, then during the big place and route, um, this, this sort of schematic of the circuit is combined with the knowledge of the actual FPGA, which you're targeting, and you get a technology map netlist. So sort of netlist augmented with the placement information of where each of these elements goes into the actual FPGA chip. And then finally, the assembler transcribes this, this augmented netlist and produces uh, whatever uh, bitstream file from, from this information. Uh, the timing analysis thing uh, is important in the high-speed designs. Uh, the idea is that um, speed of light matters, right? And it might just so happen that some signal is too slow to get to a certain latch in the design at higher speeds. And if this were to happen, then your design would just not work. And there are software tools, uh, which are part of um, the vendor tools, uh, which allow you to check for this and eventually indicate that there is a problem. And finally, the simulation visualization just allows you to uh, check whether your design um, matches some criterions so we can build some sort of test benches, test cases for their design, run the simulation and check for the result whether this is, this is okay or not. Okay, so analysis and synthesis a little bit more in detail. Uh, I just mentioned that uh, this goes from HDL to Netlist. That means from the source hardware description language files 
uh, to a sort of a schematic. Uh, during the analysis step, um, the source files are loaded into the memory, checked whether they are even a valid, you know, Verilog, VHDL, or other uh, high-level synthesis files. Um, in this step, you also check whether all the logic is reachable or if you can just drop any piece of the HDL files because it's, it's just not reachable and build some sort of in-memory representation of the circuit. And during the synthesis step, you dump this into the netlist, usually storing it onto, onto drive or storage. Now, there's uh, sort of an in, kind of intermediate step in this process. Uh, there's a lot of intermediate steps, but one is kind of particularly interesting is that there's a logic minimization also in that. So when you have um, this uh, sort of circuit schematic in, in the memory, you do equivalent changes on that representation and try to minimize the logic as much as possible so you don't, you don't waste space in the FPGA. There are open source tools for that, by the way. Uh, so I'd like to show you three tools in, in this uh, chapter in the analysis and synthesis. And uh, one of them is Icarus. This, this is a great tool. Uh, then there is Odin2 and Yosis. This one is also awesome. So Icarus, um, I have it here because it used to be able to do synthesis into uh, gate-level netlist. It uh, cannot do that anymore, but um, Icarus is a, has a great Verilog parser, and it is really pedantic. So even if you have a proprietary flow, if you want to verify your Verilog, just let Icarus parse it, and it will poke holes into, into your design and tell you, like, yeah, there, there are some warnings, your Verilog is not completely perfect, this sort of thing. So, yeah. It has limited VHDL support, although given the name, it's, it's not really the target, right? It also can uh, generate uh, other uh, simplified Verilog as an output and so on. It's also a simulation tool, and I would like to show you a demo of, of using the Icarus Verilog for circuit simulation. No. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, definitely check this tool. It's it's uh, it's a great one, and we'll get to the simulation part shortly. Now another tool which is used mostly in academia is, is Odin2. This works also on Verilog, and it emits usually BLIF netlist. Uh, the Odin2 has been used for both um, ASIC synthesis as well as FPGA synthesis. <clears throat> it works greatly with uh, VPR. In fact. Uh, Odin2 is uh, now bundled with VPR into Verilog2 routing uh, toolset, which you can, I believe, find in, yeah, in, in the web, in the GitHub there. And um, yeah. it's been actually used for ASIC synthesis, and it's not really that often used for FPGA synthesis. What is used for FPGA synthesis is Yosis, right? So Yosis is rather a newcomer, but it's written in a, in a really great way, the Yosis. And it's, it's modern code. It doesn't have any legacy in that. And the other thing which is great about the Yosis is that it can take uh, chip libraries and uh, generate netlist with uh, chip elements for uh, ASIC cell libraries, so it can be used in ASIC synthesis. It can use the Xilinx 7 series libraries, so uh, you can use it instead of, I believe, the analysis and synthesis tab uh, in Vivado. And then it can generate the latest 40 FP, then it can use the latest 40 uh, series chip libraries to, to generate a bit, uh, to generate an augmented netlist for uh, further processing in the, in the IceStorm project. So that's that. All right. <clears throat> uh, yeah, one thing which is kind of important is that this works only on Verilog now, but uh, the VHDL is being worked on. So the Yosis will eventually support even VHDL if that's your thing. So that's the analysis and synthesis. Uh, are there any questions regarding these tools for analysis and synthesis? Yes. Um, yeah, well, uh, Odin 2, I, I didn't really study the Odin 2 one. 
Uh, but uh, regarding Yosis, this is uh, high quality code that's being actually actively worked on. There is a community around that one. So this would be a tool of choice if, if you want to, to look into things. Uh, the Icarus Verilog is, I believe, almost one-man show sort of thing, but the, the Verilog parser is excellent. Does this answer your question? Yes. I'll get to that uh, in the simulation part. So yes, thanks. There is very later as well. Okay, let's move on. Um, place and route. Uh, this, in this um, step of the of the build process, uh, you take the netlist and convert it into a technology map netlist. So basically, you, uh, in this step, the the knowledge of the target FPGA enters the picture. Uh, you take the netlist and kind of place it into the FPGA or compute the, the placement of, of the elements from the netlist in the target FPGA. Now, this has multiple sub-steps. Um, one of them is PAC, so if, if you remember the, the logic array blocks at the beginning, the clusters of the logic, then these are created in the PAC step. It puts the logic which is close by in the design, which should be close by in the design, uh, close together, packs it into these clusters so that um, there are no long connections in the FPGA itself, because again, speed of light matters. And then there's place, so it computes where these clusters go in, in the final FPGA, and then there is root, which connects the interconnect between this, these clusters. Now there are two tools, one of them is Arachne PNR, which is kind of specific to, to IC40 FPGA from latest, and then there's a really generic one, VPR, uh, very quickly, the Arachne PNR. Uh, this is specifically written for the IC for the FPGA. It works together with <coughs> with the Yosis tool. Uh, it takes this uh, kind of technology map netlist from from the Yosis, uh, does the place and root step on that, and produces um, textual representation of what goes into the IC for the FPGA. So when you look at the Arachne PNR, you'll kind of notice that the, the boundary between the analysis and synthesis and the place and root is not really that sharp, and also between uh, the place and root and assembler. But there is a sort of distinction, so it's not like completely ad hoc. Uh, you can find the sources here. It's not actually uh, entirely part of the Project Ice Storm. It's kind of outside, but it's used together with uh, you know, the, the OSIS and <coughs> the other iStorm tools. Now, uh, VPR is another tool. This is uh, generally a research tool, but it's extremely flexible. Uh, it's now part of the Verilog to routing together with the Odin2 uh, analysis and synthesis tool. The thing about this is that you can build uh, any sort of uh, FPGA model and load it into the VPR, and it will use that model. So. It gives you that flexibility. Uh, I believe the FPGA vendors are actually providing some sort of, um, uh, let's say, inaccurate and uh, inaccurate models, which kind of match their FPGA without revealing too much about that technology, so that the researchers can actually use the, the VPR for um, doing routing research. Also, this one works with the vendor tools, so you can use this instead of the <coughs> place and route step in the, in the vendor tools. Uh, you can find the original VPR at the website of University of Toronto, which is a big research hub for FPGAs. And then also check the Odin2 if there is no newer version in, in that repository. So that's place and route. And now finally, assembler. Uh, as you can see, as, as we are coming closer to the hardware, uh, my voice is starting to fail. <laughs> And also, the amount of tools is, is getting lower and lower. This, this kind of is the set truth. So the, the closer you get to the hardware, the amount of tools is just decreasing because there is this increasing amount of low-level knowledge which you need to have to implement these tools. Now, uh, what Assembler does is it takes the, the place through the netlist, the, the augmented netlist with the information of, of for where each part goes into FPGA and just transcribes it into some sort of binary format, uh, which is the bitstream. There can be multiple formats of bitstream that the assembler supports, depending, uh, let's say, on, on the programming type of the FPGA. So in case you're programming the FPGA over JTAG, that might require different bitstream format than, for example, programming from an SPI flash. 
the problem with open source assemblers is that the FPGA technology, the bitstream format, is like the family gold of the FPGA vendors. It's just not going to be released uh, ever, unfortunately. And um, yeah, let's just take a quick look at the ice pack. So the ice pack is, again, specific to the IC40 FPGA. Um, it's part of the iStore project. It takes the outpad from the Arachne PNR, the textual representation of what goes into the FPGA, <coughs> into the IC40 FPGA, and just transcribes it into a binary. Uh, you can find the, the iStorm tools at, at that website. There's also a tool which goes the other way, which is called the Ice Unpack. It's also part of the project iStorm, all the iStorm tools. So uh, let's just do a quick recap. There are uh, full design flows. I actually had multiple ones here, but they were ASIC tools. So in case we talk about FPGAs, we only find this, this iStorm project. Um, so the iStorm project is specific to the IC40 FPGA. It contains, consists of uh, three tools implementing this, these three steps. Yosis, or Achne PNR, and uh, IcePack for analysis synthesis, place and root, and uh, bitstream generation. It is actually a complete open source flow for this IC40 FPGA. And it's so far the only one. Uh, there are additional tools, Iceproc for a programmer, so you don't need the latest tools at all. You can use completely open source tools to program the FPGA. And there is now even newer IceTime, which allows you to perform timing analysis for the IC40 without the latest tools. <coughs> okay. Now, I, I have a demo how to use the IceStorm project. Yes. Uh, no, the only thing missing from an open source toolchain for any FPGA is a model for possibly with the VPR, so for the place and the root, and then the assembler. So the analysis and synthesis tools are available. Um, the framework for place and the root is available, but not the model for it, for the VPR, and the assembler is not available. But if this became available, then yes, we would have an open source toolchain with the state of the art place and the root algorithms for pretty much any FPGA which would be wonderful. Uh, thank you for the question. Did it answer your question? Right. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, let me do the demo. Um, so what I do here is I implement the gray counter. So I had this board which had eight LEDs and it had an oscillator and an ICE40 FPGA. Uh, so I modeled it in the following way. I just have an oscillator input, that's the hardware clock, and then I have eight LEDs, which are the outputs. Um, you don't have to make photos, the slides will be available, you know. <laughs> so you can just download it and I can send you this, the sources if, if you want that. It's not a problem. Just drop me an email. Um, so what I do here is, is I have a counter register which is 8-bit and um, I hope this still works. Uh, in here, I always, in, I always increment it on a tick of the hardware clock, on positive edge of the, uh, edge of the hardware clock. And then I assign the LEDs in such a way that they uh, perform the, the gray counting. Uh, I forgot to explain what the gray counting is. Um, it's different from binary counting in such a way that uh, each two consecutive uh, numbers in, in the gray counter differ just by one bit. So it is, it's kind of beneficial when you are designing hardware. So this is what happens in here. Now, since I have implemented my top-level module and I have the, the gray counter there, I also still need to map the signals from the top-level module into uh, the actual pins of the FPGA. This is what I do in my pin map. And here I only define which signal goes to which pin of the, of the FPGA. This is specific to your dev kit or to your um, design. So this is what I define in here. And finally, I build the entire design. So I, I use the YOSIS for the analysis and synthesis. I use the SynthIC40 command, although it is possible to poke into the YOSIS analysis and synthesis step some more and use the, the specific subcommands by, by hand to, to get some sort of more control over the analysis and synthesis process. Here I just used the, the bulk command, the SynthIC40. I specify that my uh, top level 
Um, uh, that my top-level design file is called top, and that I want to generate a BLIF netlist, which is called uh, top.blif. I provide the top v verilog file, which I wrote here. This, this is called the top v. This is the second half of it. So I provide it to the Yosis, and it will do its thing and pro uh, produce the top blif netlist. Now, uh, the next thing I do is I use Arachne PNR, as a place and root step, I specify that my particular FPGA is HXX8K CT256 with these first two parameters. Uh, the next parameter is that I want to outpad the top TXT, which will be the textual representation of, of the content of the FPGA. I specify my pin map here. That's uh, that's this thing here, which I which I wrote, where I just map the pins to the signals, and I provide the top BLIF, the, the BLIF netlist. So when I have the top TXT, this will take like a couple of seconds on, on any modern hardware. I use just the iSpec to transcribe it into a binary file, and then I use ISPro to, <coughs> to program it into the FPGA. <coughs> now, I, I would definitely like to show you the board, which does the grain counting, but like I said, I, I kind of forgot it. So I'll show you the simulation, and then you will see how it's supposed to work. Let's talk about simulation verification. Um, are there any questions regarding the, the ice storm demo? No. How yes. Um, well, the cheapest one is, is like 25 bucks. It's extremely cheap, but it's unobtainium now because uh, when the ice storm hit the news, it's just everyone bought the kit and the lead time was like 29 weeks, right? And uh, there's a more expensive one, like 50 bucks or something with a larger FPGA, and you can still buy that one until they restock the, the cheaper one. Thanks for the question. So moving on to, to analysis and synthesis. Um, sorry, to, to simulation and visualization. Um, so the idea here is that you take your HDL designs and you simulate them on the host in, um, on a, on a clock, per clock basis. Um, the thing is that, that you can write a test bench for your design and <coughs> provide input into your designs and then check whether after a set amount of clock or at some event if, if uh, the outputs match what you expect. Uh, this helps during development uh, because if you do some change to your design, then, then you can just rerun the simulations and see whether your design is still matching the specification at the beginning. Of, of design process, or if you changed something and, and broke something. Uh, it also helps if you are looking for some bug, then, then just take the IP block, run the simulation, take a look at um, what happened there at the signals. You can poke into the signals in the IP block and see what's going on in there. There are multiple tools for this because you don't need the actual knowledge of the FPGA, so, so these tools uh, do exist. Um, I would like to talk about GHDL first because this is a uh, VHDL tool. It translates uh, VHDL into native code, so it's extremely fast. And uh, the problem is that while it can output the VCD, the value change dump, the, the venerable text representation of, of the simulation, uh, Verilog, uh, sorry, VHDL um, needs some, some more information in, in the simulation output, so uh, GHDL had to create their own format. Uh, but you don't have to be really afraid of that, of, of the GHDL uh, waveform format, because uh, GTK Wave, the, the visualization tool, can work with that and many other formats. So that's the GHDL. Um, there is also Verilator. That one translate uh, Verilog, I believe, into C++. Uh, except that the Verilog parser is not as complete as, as the Icarus one. So I'll just, just mention it very quickly here that it exists. And I'll go, I'll move on to, to the Icarus Verilog. Uh, so this one is primarily simulation and uh, translation tool. I would like to talk about the simulation capabilities now. Um, <coughs> so you provide the, the Icarus with, with your Verilog design. It will parse it. The, the parser is extremely pedantic, which is, which is great. It, it really picks out even bugs which vendor tools don't show you or don't warn you about. So definitely use that. Um, it doesn't 
compile the, the Verilog into a native code. Instead, it, it produces some sort of intermediate VVP code. And this is then interpreted by a tool which is part of the Icarus suite, uh, VVP tool, to, to, provide, to, to produce the, the output of the simulation. Uh, you can also visualize the output of the, from, the, <coughs> from the Icarus Verilog using the GTK Wave tool. Uh, the website is at the following link. Now, let's do a demo. So how do you write a, a test bench from your, for your design using Icarus Verilog? It's actually pretty simple. So you, devi you define your signals in, in the test bench. Uh, the name of the test bench module is, is top TB. It has no signals because it's a test bench. Uh, then in the next step, you instantiate your module which you want to simulate. In my case, I just put everything into the top and I'll be using the, the gray counter demo here. So I instantiate that, connect the signals into this, this top module, and then finally I, I perform the simulation step. Now, this is the actual um, piece of code which describes the simulation. So first of all, I specify where I want to dump the result of, of, the, simu <coughs> of the simulation, and I set my clock to zero, and then I toggle the clock 1,000 times. And to perform the simulation, I first have to translate this, this, this test bench into the VVP uh, intermediate code. I do that using the Everlook tool. I use both of the test bench source and the original IP block source, which is the top V. I use that in, in the OSIS demo. And then I use the VVP tool to interpret the, the VVP output. Um, I have additional parameter there for the VVP tool. Uh, it's the LXT2. Um, this tells the VVP tool to generate um, the output in an LXT2 format, which is a binary format, the output of the simulation. Now, the thing is, uh, by default, VVP will produce a value change dump uh, output of simulation. And this is like, this will generate huge files, which are slow to, slowly being parsed by, by the GTK wave. And it's annoying to work with, it's just huge. So instead of that, I'm using the LXT2 format. It's binary, it's much smaller and easier to work with. Um, you don't have to be really afraid that it's binary because it's documented, it's an open format, it's just smaller by size. And it can be converted to, to VCD if, if needed be. Now, uh, finally, I visualize this, this output, the TopTB LXT, uh, using GTK Wave, and this is the output you get if you load it into the GTK wave. You can see on the, on the right side the LEDs and how they are counting. <clears throat> so, that, so that's the, the gray counter example. Uh, I mentioned GTK wave, so it's a visualization tool. It supports multiple formats. Um, whatever goes out of, of the Icarus Verilog of the GTK wave, you can put into, uh, in, of the GHDL, then you can put it into the GTK wave and it will display that, so it's great. And you can find it on this, this website. Now, any questions for, to the visualization part? Okay, um, so I have one final slide which I would like to do, um, and then, then I'll conclude the talk. Um, why are FPGA tools so hard? Um, I hope I gave you some, some idea why there are such problems. But to summarize it, there's a lack of documentation of, of the FPGA hardware itself. The bitstream is undocumented. It's like the family goal of, of the FPGA vendors. Um, another thing is that, uh, well, why you will never get an open source Quartus or Vivado is that um, the vendors invested um, arcane amount of money into fine tuning these tools to perfection and they, they invested like boatloads of money into the algorithms and they don't want to release that, which is understandable, kind of. And then, the then there's another thing, is the pushback from the IP vendors. So they are afraid that if the bitstream format was documented, there might be someone who would like take the FPGA content and reverse engineer their precious tested IP core from that and convert it back into Verilog without paying for it. So these are, I believe, the, the three main reasons why FPGA tool, the FPGA tools, which are open source, are so problematic.
and so much, so suffering. Um, and this is where I would conclude the talk. So, do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, considering the um, the IS40 has been so comprehensively supported by the OSS project now. Exactly. Um, yeah. Has Lattice uh, reacted to this at all? I mean, considering that apparently their sales have increased because of it. Yes, their sales have been skyrocketing on these small FPGAs. That's true. Uh, Lattice, I believe they don't. They didn't react on that particular one, but. Um, the IP vendors did actually react slightly and have been bombarding the project at times with uh, this, this exact problem that they're afraid someone might steal their IP. Although I, I don't think this, is, uh, this, this makes sense because if you wanted to steal someone's IP from the FPGA, you would have to put so much work into going from the IP all the way to any sort of HTL that it's not worth it. It, it makes much more sense to just write it from scratch. Thank you for the question. Yes. You were saying about the algorithm, just the, the second reason. Which algorithm was you talking about? Um, so in case you're doing um, FPGA design on, on huge FPGAs, it takes a lot of time, right? So there is a lot of heuristics in that, in the place on the root step, which is, uh, I believe, NP complete problem, or NP hard even. Uh, so there's a lot of heuristics which allow you to do it kind of efficiently and Kind of well, okay. and they see that as a differentiator in, in their tools, not just in their yes. short FPGA system. That's correct. I mean, the, the FPGA technology is kind of extremely simple thing. Sure, you have some specialty blocks in the FPGA, uh, but the the bulk of the FPGA is the fabric, and this is really not such a difficult thing. It's just a collection of lookup tables and registers copy it multiple times over and connect it with a programmable interconnect, and that's really it. Does it answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Yes. So the question is, uh, or well, the comment is that um, the same guy who's been doing the Ice Storm wor uh, work is now working on the Xilinx 7 series uh, documentation, a uh, bitstream documentation, and the question was whether I know someone doing anything on Altera. Uh, while yes, there is ongoing work on the older Altera FPGAs, um, it is not exactly public yet. And uh, in case there is interest, I, I guess I can hook you up if, if you are interested in helping the, the project on the Altera side. Yes. Um, does it answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. So any more questions? All right. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the end game. <laughs> <laughs>